chapter 1 we're going to look at this morning. We're nearing the very end of our series on grace, grace poured out, how uh, all of us as believers on our uh, journey of faith, we need God's grace, and we've seen all these different aspects of it. And this morning we're going to look at reassuring grace. Uh, the, I know we have several people uh, within us. I'm one of those people that from time to time it's easy to get discouraged. Some people deal with depression. You may be here this morning. You may be one of those people. Uh, God wants us to be able to exchange our lives uh, instead of having our lives filled with fear, instead of having lives filled with uh, doubt and dread. uh, Through the power of his grace, he will allow us to exchange those things for power, love, and a sound mind. We'll see that in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, it's interesting as he writes his epistles, uh, that he often begins with the phrase, grace to you. And he does the same thing here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He begins by talking about grace, leading off with that. And we jump down to verse number 5, and he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And so Paul's writing this letter, these early churches, these first century believers, they face great persecution. Uh, We talked about that uh, last week. Uh, And because at this point in time, Christianity, it was not a socially acceptable religion. A lot of people today, uh, or at least in years past, it's maybe starting to become less socially acceptable now. Uh, But for many years, it's kind of been the socially acceptable thing is to consider yourself a Christian. Well, in these early days, it was not. When you announced to friends and family and the people that you were around, you were putting yourself at great risk. You were putting your livelihood at risk. People would lose their jobs. They would lose friendships. They would lose relationships by announcing that they have chosen to follow this man named Jesus and this, uh, this way that we call now Christianity. So it's not surprising that Paul, as he would write letters to these believers, as he would write letters to these churches, that he would begin by mentioning God's grace, because they definitely needed God's grace in their lives with all of the things that they were dealing with at that time. And, you know, we need God's grace today just as much as those believers did. Uh, the things that we face in our lives, uh, it's, it's hard to face those things a lot of times without God's grace to help us. And so in the very next chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, talking about the battles that we face from day to day, the battles that Timothy would face from day to day. Paul said to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And that's a good message for us this morning. We're to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And it's there for us. It's available. He wants to pour it out in our lives. Uh, But it's not something he forces on us. Uh, It's up to us. It's there. But he's not going to force it. We remember that verse we looked at last week from the church at Laodicea, Revelation chapter 3. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. A lot of times, again, we use that maybe talking about salvation, but that verse is written to believers that God's grace is available. He's standing at the door knocking. That church had kind of fallen out of love with Jesus. He was there. Revival was waiting. He was knocking on the door. Same way with his grace. It's available to us. He's knocking. It's up to us to answer that call. And so receiving God's grace, it's not just this one-time event. You know, when we get saved, we receive His saving grace. But as we've seen through this series, there's all different types of grace that as believers we need in our lives. And so it's not this one-time event. We need His grace over and over and over again. And Timothy, this young pastor that Paul was writing, uh, this is the last words that Paul would write on uh, on this earth, was 2 Timothy. And he needed a special measure of grace for the ministry that God had called him to. Timothy, he's about to to lose his mentor. His father in the faith, Paul, is about to depart this earth. And so Timothy needs some special grace from God. And it makes me 
makes me realize that apart from the grace of God, just like in Timothy's life, Timothy needed the grace of God in his life to do the ministry that God had called him to do. And it's the same way for me and it's the same way for you. Apart from the grace of God in your life, we're not ever going to be effective at ministering, at serving the way that God has called us to serve if we don't have His grace poured out in our lives. It doesn't matter if you're pastoring a church. Uh, The pastor definitely needs a special touch of God's grace to do what God's called him to do. But so does the Sunday school teacher. The average ordinary church member, you need God's grace in your life to be a choir member, to be a Sunday school teacher, to be a children's church worker, uh, to witness to the lost, to disciple a convert. Every way that you minister, you need God's grace poured out in your life to be able to do it. And that not only helps us grow personally when we have God's grace in our lives, but the more that we experience God's grace, we can encourage others. It helps us to encourage others. And so Paul, in these verses that we looked at here this morning, he draws a contrast between two different spirits. There's the spirit of the world, which is characterized by fear. You have the spirit of the world there, the spirit of fear, doubt, the spirit of worry. And then we have the spirit of grace, which is characterized by power and love and soundness of mind. That's what God has called us as believers to. Uh, He doesn't want us to have the spirit of the world. We have a new nature within us. He wants us to experience the blessings that he has for us. And so Paul, as he writes these words about grace, this isn't just theory that Paul is talking about. Again, these are the last words that he will ever write. He knows what his fate is. And so he's speaking from a really practical point. This isn't just, you know, oh, this sounds good to write. Let's write this. No, Paul had God's grace poured out in his life to be able to minister to somebody else while Paul was going through what he was going through and knew that he was about to lose his life for the cause of Jesus Christ, to be able to pour his heart out and to share God's grace with Timothy and share his grace with us today through the the Holy Spirit's uh, inspired words that he wrote. So he's speaking practically. Let's look at this morning how grace can provide reassurance to us. I mean, here's Paul. He's the guy that's in prison. He's the guy that's about to die. And what does he do with his final words? He's trying to give assurance of mind to somebody else. Wow. So let's look at the circumstances and how grace provides us reassurance no matter what circumstances we're facing. It begins with his grace reassures us with power. God's grace gives us power for our daily lives. The world will offer us substitutes, just like it does in a whole lot of areas. The world always offers substitutes for things. Um, It's not uncommon to hear people talk about, you know, the power of positive thinking. Man's system, the world's system, humanistic thinking, humanistic philosophy, uh, it has substitutes for the power of God. But none of them equal up to the power of God. Uh, We need his power working in us and through us to accomplish his purpose for our lives. Uh, You'll hear people, you know, they'll use phrases like, you know, be all that you can be. I was listening uh, to a book this week where the author was talking about that phrase, be all that you can be. Uh, It's kind of hard within our own power to be all that we can be. Through the Holy Spirit's power, he can empower us to be everything that we can be. But when we do it through our own strength, we fail. And so first we have power as believers through the Holy Spirit. Because worry, fear, doubt, depression, all those things leave us worn down in life from our, from our struggles as we go through things in our own strength. And we talked way back at the beginning of this series, we talked about how we have, you know, just like your car has a fuel tank, as believers we have a grace tank, and sometimes our grace tanks get kind of low, and we need to be refilled with His grace. Well, that's the Holy Spirit's power that He offers to us. Uh, He offers to replace our inadequate resources with His infinite resources of grace. And as we read uh, in those verses there in 2 Timothy, uh, He says for the... Uh, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Uh, That comes from the same word that we get our word dynamite from. 
God, He has such power. It's a, it's a dynamite power that the Holy Spirit gives us as believers. We'll run low in our own strength. Uh, I like the song. We teach our kids this in children's church. You know, we, we teach them from a young age to sing that song. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And as kids, you know, kids really, they'll believe what you teach them in Sunday school when you're teaching them at home, they'll soak that in. They'll believe that God's big. But somehow, as we're raised in church, sometimes when we get to be adults, we kind of forget how strong and how mighty our God can be. We lose that. One of my favorite names for God in the Old Testament is where it refers to him as Almighty God. As you read back through historical documents, it was not uncommon for many of our founding fathers to talk about the Almighty. And that's, a, that's a name for God that a lot of us don't really use anymore. But it's a good reminder that he's almighty. And so as a believer, the moment that you were saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence in your heart. You received his presence that will never forsake you. It'll never abandon you. The book of Hebrews tells us he's with you forever. And he gives you constant access to his power. It's not our will that's the source of the power that we find in life. It's access to the Holy Spirit of God, His strength, when we're depending on Him rather than ourselves. When we choose to depend on ourselves, that's usually when we find ourselves really struggling. That's when we can find ourselves filled with worry, fear, doubt. Once you get back in the Word of God, it's one of the reasons why having a devotional life, reading the Word of God uh, on a daily basis, uh, taking in spiritual things on a daily basis, listening to, to Christian music on a daily basis, all of those things, the more that you saturate your life with things from the Word of God, spiritual things, set your affection on things above, Paul said. The more that we do that, the more we access the power that the Holy Spirit gives us, the more we're able to rise above the worry, the fear, the doubt, the spirit of this world that is trying to take over our lives, and we access the spirit of power that God wants for our lives. And then it's also good to note as we're thinking about the Holy Spirit in our lives, one possible reason why sometimes as believers we can fail to feel like we have that Holy Spirit power in our lives helping us is because the Bible says that it is possible to quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can grieve the Holy Spirit in our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul says, quench not the Spirit. Uh, it's the third person of the Trinity. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a real person. It's not this, you know, mystical thing. I love Star Wars. It's not the force. You know, may the force be with you. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person. The Holy Spirit has feelings. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be quenched. The Holy Spirit uh, can get to the point where you don't feel the power from the Holy Spirit. Because you have either through rebellion, disobedience, bitterness. We've talked about bitterness the last couple of weeks. Through hidden sin, different things in our lives can quench the Holy Spirit. Where that relationship's not the way that it should be. That's why we need repentance. That's why we need revival like we talked about last week. When we get back where we are in a revived state, where we have that reviving grace in our lives, we don't have a... The wall separating the relationship between us and the Holy Spirit of God. It's easy to, you know, quench a person's spirit. We can do that to people. Just like we can do it to the Holy Spirit. We can quench relationships in our lives. I heard about the guy whose wife hadn't spoken to him in three days. And he was telling the story about how she woke up. Uh, one night, she told her husband, she said, I hear a noise downstairs. I think there's burglars in the house. And he's listening. He's like, I don't know. She's like, no, I hear them. She said, it sounds like they just opened the fridge. It sounds like they're eating my pork casserole. He said, well, that'll teach him. And boom, she didn't talk to him for three days. He quenched, the, he quenched that relationship. Sometimes we can do the same thing, can't we? Uh, we shouldn't go along struggling without the power of God. There's no reason as believers that we do that. But many times we do because we're stubborn, we're selfish, we're self-willed. 
So examine your heart. If you're struggling, if you're one of those people, you struggle with worry, doubt, and fear, begin by examining your heart. Is there bitterness there, like we've talked about the last couple weeks? Is there some sort of disobedience? Is there some sort of rebellion? Is there some sort of besetting sin, something that we're harboring in our hearts that's quenching the Holy Spirit's ability to impart grace in our lives? That's a good place to start. We always examine ourselves first. And if that's the case, do what we talked about last week. Repent, get rid of those things, and get things right with God. And then he says he gives us power uh, for every burden. Timothy was going to face a lot of burdens in his life. Paul, again, is about to pass away. He's going to pass off this scene here. He's no longer going to be there for Timothy to rely on. And so Timothy, as a relatively young man still, uh, not everyone took him seriously as a spiritual leader. And Paul knew that he was going to face some hardships and some struggles. And so he's trying to reassure Timothy with these words. Timothy, you're going to have to confront false teaching in the church. You're going to have to confront apostasy in the church. Uh, Without my help, I'm not here. Timothy, you're going to face persecution. Uh, Church history tells us that while Timothy was pastoring uh, the church at Ephesus, that he was martyred for his opposition to idolatry in the city of Ephesus. He, He took on the words of Paul. He took it to heart. He endured with the grace of God. He fought as a good soldier, just like Paul did. Uh, And he he stood for the cause of Christ. And history tells us that he faced uh, martyrdom because of his opposition to it. And so Paul knew, Timothy, you really need God's grace for the things that you're going to go through. And he begins by, uh, in 1 Thessalonians, he talked about how God will give us power for witnessing. Because we need that in our lives. Uh, most, Most of us. If we, were, if we were honest, most people would raise their hand this morning and say that it's probably difficult for us to go up and speak to someone about the gospel. It's just not a natural thing for us to do. We, we need God's power to be able to do that. That can be a scary thing to do, to go up and begin to talk to somebody about their eternal destiny. I like what the evangelist uh, Gypsy Smith said. Uh, He said, anyone can preach to a crowd. It takes the grace of God to preach to one man. I was telling somebody the other night that when you're speaking, I think it was Chad, Chad and I were talking about this, it's a lot easier to stand up and speak in front of a room that's full of people. I don't get anywhere near as nervous talking to the more people that are in the room, the less nervous I am. The smaller the crowd is, the more intimate the conversation becomes, the more difficult it is. And when you begin talking to somebody one-on-one about salvation, man, anyone can preach to a crowd, but it takes the grace of God to preach to one man. And so I know I have been guilty of this. When we've gone out soul winning, knocking on doors, you knock on that door, and there's just kind of this hope in the back of your mind that, Maybe nobody will answer this door. And you don't knock that loud. You know, you're kind of like, I don't think they're here. Let's, you know, somebody else be like, no, there's a doorbell. Ring the doorbell. Like, ah, you know, we really don't want to disturb them. You know, they probably heard that. You know, they're probably doing something else. Uh, Because that fear, the spirit of the world can kind of take over. And we can have that fear where we don't want to, we don't want to talk to people about the gospel. Yeah. The only, you know, if you see the doorbells disconnected, that's when you push the doorbell and you're like, well, no, they're not here. You know, I don't, I guess I tried. I don't have to talk to these people, though. Uh, some people I've been with, man, they knock on the door like it's the, you know, it's like the cops. They're like banging down. Try, we're gonna, <laughs> is that what Jameson does? Puts his foot up there and bangs against it a few times. Make sure they know we were there. Uh, but we need power for witnessing. Uh, even if we know all the verses, even if we know how to walk somebody through the plan of salvation, we still can't win. Even if if you're not afraid to talk to somebody face-to-face, you have a boldness to be able to witness, you still can't win anybody in your own power. It takes the Holy Spirit's power to be able to convict that person and to bring them in. Uh, And so our witnessing will fail every time 
you'll either fail on the front end because you're too scared of the face of man, as one of the prophets said, or you'll fail on the back end because you feel like, man, I, I'm not scared to go knock on these doors, and you get built up with a little bit of pride, and you have that problem where you feel like, man, I'm doing this in my own strength and my own power. And then there's power for persecution. Again, like Timothy was facing, it was very real. We know believers around the world today are still facing severe persecution in other parts of the world uh, and persecution of believers. I believe here in the United States, we'll only continue to see it grow here. Thank God we've had a, a, a couple hundred years of freedom where as believers we've not faced uh, severe persecution like many are facing around the world. It may not always be the case. And we will definitely need, as believers this morning, we're kind of talking in theory here, that there's power for persecution. And we're all like, yeah, that sounds good. But what if you were one of the believers somewhere else in the world this morning where you were actually facing severe persecution had you shown up at a house of worship? Then we go from talking about God's grace and persecution in theory to really experiencing it in everyday life. And Paul... He said, to be able to stand firmly against opposition and persecution in life, we need the power of God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse number 10, he said that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Hey, God wants us to be able to go through everything we go through in life. He wants us to be able to do it with joy. Paul was able to go through what he went through, and he said he was able to do it with joy. Wow. That's only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in your life Amen. through his grace being poured out. Next, his grace reassures us with love. When we face difficulties, when we face persecution, when we face problems, when we face trials and testing, we need the reassurance of love. Uh, last night at the house, I forget what had happened, but Claire had done something, and I saw Lauren, she kissed her foot because her foot was hurt. And so it always makes things feel better when mommy kisses something that hurts, right? Now, does it actually heal anything? What is it? It's the expression of love that reassures us, hey, everything's going to be okay. Mom's here. Dad's here. Everything's going to be fine. I remember as a kid, you know, if I was scared of something at night, I might call out for Dad, and if he showed up to the room, I knew everything was okay because his love was reassuring to me. It's the same way with our Heavenly Father. He reassures us with His love. Grace comes to our hearts when we're hurting. God will pour out His grace in our lives. He'll reassure us with His love. He'll give us, number one, a love for God. That's, he, he provides us first with that personal relationship. You know, that's more than just having a, you know, a bumper sticker that says, Honk if you love Jesus, you know. Um, as we begin to think about what he's done for us, how he loved us so much. That's why in the book of 1 John it says we love him because he first loved us. We think about how he brings us salvation. That begins to fill our hearts with love. And our love for God is not something that we produce on our own. It's a reflection and a response to the love that he first just lavished and poured out on us. We didn't initiate our love for him. Uh, in fact, the Bible tells us that we were enemies of God, yet he came seeking for us. Amen. The book of Isaiah, we use this verse Wednesday night, that we've turned everyone to his own way. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. I mean, we literally have nothing to offer God. Yep. And he came to seek and save the lost is what Jesus said. And so it's a gracious, sacrificial love. I mean, it can't be measured or compared to any other human standard. It's like Charles Wesley wrote in uh, one of his hymns that it's a love divine, all loves excelling. His love goes far and above beyond, like the other hymn that we sing, the love of God, what tongue or pen can ever tell. 
reaches far beyond the stars of heaven. It goes far beyond the depths of the sea. One pastor said that he was preparing to preach a message on the love of God, and he went into his computer program to do a search, and he used the phrase, the love of God. And he said it popped up a message that said, your search inquiry returned too many results. Please refine your search. And he said, you know, that was a really good reminder that we have a God who loves us so much that we can't begin to search the riches of his love. There's just, it's too vast for us to be able to comprehend it. And then once we have his love, you know what he wants? He wants us to reflect that love to others. Uh, because love is not just simply a feeling of affection for someone. What is love? That's when we're actively working and sacrificing to make the other person's, love, uh, the other person's life better. It was the love of God that sent Jesus to die for our sins. He was actively working to make our lives better. Uh, it wasn't that he just said that he loved us. That's why I like that verse in Romans, Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. And we always use that verse with the kids. And like, how many kids know what the word commendeth mean? You think kids know what the word commendeth mean? I don't think so either. So how many of you know what the word commendeth means? <laughs> yeah, that's a big word, right? Uh, it means that he proved. He didn't say that he loved us only. He proved, he demonstrated his love. How? Well, the verse tells us that God commendeth or demonstrated or proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love went far beyond just words. It went to him doing something. And that's what should motivate us to reflect his love to a lost and dying world. We just wrapped up Missions Month and talked about reaching the entire world for Jesus. Uh, and this should be that love that we want to reflect which takes us into not just a love for God, but a love for others. Paul told us that in our lives, when we're yielded to the Holy Spirit, when we're in a right relationship with God, he says there will be some fruit that's evident in your life. And the very first thing Paul said will be evident in the life of a believer who is experiencing the grace that God is pouring out. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love. You're going to be demonstrating love to other people. Paul said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the Spirit in our lives should have love, number one, first and foremost, present. And when we love God, we're walking in the Spirit. That means it should be natural for us to love others. Yep. Go to the book of uh, 1 John and read. It really talks about loving God, loving others. As believers, we should be known as loving individuals, showing, reflecting the love of God. And when we start to love other people, there's a real possibility that you're going to get hurt. That's a real possibility. In ministry, as you deal with people, as you try to love people, because we're all just humans with sinful natures, and we give into the flesh sometimes, we can do things that hurt people. And as a believer, if you're showing love, you're going to take the risk of being hurt. Sometimes husbands and wives are afraid to fully love their spouse because of something that may have happened in the past. And we kind of hold on to those things. Well, we're never going to love somebody the way that we should love them if we continue to hold on to things from the past. Because that's part of the spirit of fear. And the spirit of fear, the spirit of doubt, the, the spirit that brings up those things, that's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God tells us that when he saved us, he put our sins as far as the east is from the west. It says that, that he's buried our sins in the depths of the sea, never to be remembered again. And so that's the spirit that God wants in our lives, that we're able to forgive people, we're able to put the past behind, and his spirit will enable you to do that. And then the last thing we see this morning, it says grace reassures us with a sound mind. A sound mind is a mind that's well-balanced, a mind that is under sound influences. 
because there's a lot of influences in the world that are trying, striving for control of your mind. And God says we need to be controlled by a sound mind. A Satan knows that if he, can, if he can play tricks in our mind, he can really take us out of, the, out of the game. He can cause us to be ineffective as Christians when worry, doubt, fear, discouragement, uh, feeling defeated, depression, when all those things are rampant in our lives, we really don't feel like going out and showing love to other people. We don't have a love for God the way that we should. And so the Holy Spirit works in our lives. He wants us to yield our lives to him, yield control of our minds. And he gives us a sound mind, number one, first and foremost, through salvation. Hey, you're never going to have peace in life. You're never going to have a sound mind. You're never going to have a, a balanced mind until you get to this basic foundational truth that your salvation is settled and you know for sure that you're in a right relationship with God, your sins have been forgiven. When you're struggling with doubt over, am I saved, am I not saved? It's kind of hard to have peace, isn't it? And so where the devil offers doubt and insecurity and fear, God offers a certainty. He says in the book of 1 John, it says, These things have I written unto you that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God wants us to know that we have salvation through him. We can be confident that once we come to Christ in faith and salvation, that should settle our minds. Because the promises of God, like we said Wednesday night, they're better than having money in the bank. Because the promises of God are settled, the promises of God are secure. Uh, the big fancy word that we would use as we talk about the characteristics of God would be to say that the promises of God are immutable. That would be the big word that we would use. And so salvation comes alone through Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 3, verse number 4, it tells us, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God wants us to know that we have our salvation settled. Yeah. And he offers it to all of us. Not just people in this room, but the people we're talking to online, the people that may be listening to this down the road. If you're looking to have peace in life, if you're looking for a sound mind, it begins with salvation. And then we experience a sound mind through the scriptures, through the word of God. The reading of the word of God, the teaching of the word of God, the preaching of the word of God. It's foundation for a sound mind. You see, the philosophies of man, the opinions of man are constantly changing. Uh, what is considered acceptable and right and truth today, uh, that's okay, but tomorrow it may change. And last week it was something different, and 50 years ago it was different, and 100 years from now it'll be, it's constantly shifting. Because for mankind, humanistic philosophy, humanistic thinking, uh, we can't really know what truth is. It's on a sliding scale. It just kind of goes back and forth, and, and my truth is different than your truth, right? That we hear a lot of people talk about their truths today, because truth slides around. But the word of God doesn't change. Amen. It's the same. It's our standard in life. Uh, the Bible tells us in Psalm 119, where we were at Wednesday night, that the word of God is settled in heaven forever. God isn't changing what he has for us. It's still the same. And so when you build your life's foundation on the word of God, it helps us to have a sound mind because we know that this book doesn't change. It stays the same. Because our God doesn't change. He stays the same. And so through his word, we understand how God wants us to live. That's why it's important that we carefully study the Bible on a daily basis. It helps produce a sound mind. D.L. Moody, the great uh, preacher from the 18, uh, late 1800s, he said, I am glad there are things in the Bible I don't understand. If I could take that book up and read it as I would any other book, I might think I could write a book like that. 
See, you can come back to the Word of God over and over again. You can read through the same passage over and over again, and you'll find new things. You'll find new treasures. Like we talked about Wednesday night, you can find great spoils in the Word of God when you come back to it over and over again because it's a special book. The Scriptures produce a sound mind. The more Bible that you know, the more Bible that you put into practice in your life every single day, when you come to church... You pick up something that you hear at church today. You put it into practice this week. As you have your own personal devotions, you find something new that that God gives to you this week and you put that into practice. As you listen maybe to a devotional podcast throughout the week and you hear something that's, that's good and you put that into practice in your life each week, the more Bible that you know and the more of it that you put into practice, it's not just knowing it, but it's putting it into practice. Those two things go together. When you do that, you end up with a more sound mind. And it drives the worry, it drives the doubt, it drives the fear, it drives the spirit of the world away, and we're living with the spirit of grace in our lives. And then another thing that brings us a sound mind is the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus. Uh, Things happen in this world that we don't understand. Sometimes people ask the question, you know, why uh, why do bad things happen to good people? And those questions, as we try to think through why some of these things happen in life, those questions can cause us to lose our soundness of mind as we try to think through some of these things that just don't make sense to us until we realize one central truth, and that is that this life isn't all there is. Jesus is coming back one day. Uh, All the accounts are going to be settled. The injustices that we feel like we see in the world, they may go unnoticed today. But one day, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's going to settle all accounts of the world that we live in is not all there is. And so we have that comfort. Paul tells us to comfort one another with these words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We hear it many times at funerals. He says, comfort one another with these words. The persecution that you're facing, the trials that you're facing, the tests that you're facing... Jesus is coming back one day, believers. Comfort one another with these words. Allow that to produce a soundness in your mind that Jesus, he sees all the good things that you're doing. He sees the things that nobody else sees that you do for him, the love that you have for other people. God takes note of it. It's recorded in his book. The things that people do to you, one day God says the accounts will be settled because he's always in control. And so Paul wraps up these verses that we read this morning by saying that we are called according to his purpose and grace. He said, Timothy, you've been called according to God's purpose and God's grace. Uh, And he's telling us the same thing this morning. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. He has a purpose and a plan for my life. And he's not surprised by anything that happens to you. Uh, There's a song that Brian Freen Assurance uh, sung years ago that nothing takes you by surprise. Underneath these troubled skies. To us, it may, it may take us by surprise, but it didn't take God by surprise. That was written into your story. He knew what was going to happen. And so difficulties are going to come. In this life, we may never understand why, but we can trust his love. We can trust his goodness. When, when we do that, it produces a sound mind that everything is all according to his plan. And so God wants to give you grace. God wants to give you power. He wants to give you love. He wants to give you a sound mind, but the choice this morning is up to you. It's up to me. I can can choose to live with the spirit of the world. I can choose to live with worry, doubt, fear. I can struggle every day through uh, life in my own strength. Or I can choose to yield my life to the Holy Spirit. Say, God, today I need your help. I I need you to help me rise above the spirit of the world, and I need the spirit of grace today, God. Be honest with me. I mean, talk to God. That's what prayer is supposed to be, us talking to God, being real with God. It's not praying some lofty, you know, uh, big words. It's it's getting real with God and pouring your heart out and telling him, here's what I struggle with today, God, and I need your help because I can't face this on my own. I need your strength. And he'll allow you to grow in grace. That's what the book of Peter tells us. God's plan for your life is that you grow in grace and that you share it with others because he has 
our lives planned. He wants us to walk according to his plan, but it's up to us to do it. Let's pray this morning. God, thank you for the opportunity to study your word for a little while this morning. Lord, I hope that uh, we take what we've heard this morning and allow it to work in our hearts. I pray that it encourages us, Lord. I pray that you help us as believers to rise above the spirit of the world, that we would live under a spirit of grace, that we would just uh, experience your grace poured out in our lives this morning, God, that we would not live lives of worry, uh, that we would not walk around as defeated Christians, but Lord, that we would walk in the victory that you've given us. Uh, we know that, God, this morning, that every battle that we face in our life, that, that they belong to you, God, and we're, uh, we're coming to you this morning asking you to work in our hearts, uh, empower us as believers uh, to live victorious lives, to reflect your love to others, to show your grace to others, to be effective as ministers of grace in the communities that we live in. Lord, I pray this morning that uh, you would help each of us to take what we've heard this morning and put it into practice in our lives. As we move into this morning's service, I pray that our hearts are prepared for worship, that out of that great love that you've shown for us, that we would lift up our voices as we worship this morning through the music. God, I pray that our hearts would just uh, reach to heaven this morning with those songs, with the praises of your name, God, for all that you've done for us. As we move into the preaching, God, I pray that our hearts and our minds are attentive and receptive to the word of God, that we, would, that we would take what we hear this morning, Lord, and that it would work in our lives this week. We would share it with others. Lord, even through our giving this morning as an act of worship, uh, let it be a way that we can show you uh, how we love you for the things that you've done in our lives. God, we ask that you uh, just pour out your spirit on us this morning, that we know that we're meeting here in vain if you're not with us. And so, God, we ask that you uh, have your will and way in the service. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a 10-minute